Creo Simulate provides a number of different materials to you, but often you have to create your own. So in this video, we'll take a look at creating a new material and assigning it to a part. Here in the Home tab, we have a Materials command, and we have our legacy materials from Creo 3.0 and earlier. Let me go and click the Back button. Also in Creo Parametric 4.0, they added some grant materials that you have in here. And I want to use uh, a material I use a lot in aerospace, some ink and L, and I don't see it in here. So in the materials dialog box, I will click the new button to create a brand new material. And let's give it a name, and this is gonna be ink and L. I'll use the 625 variant. We can write a description, and this is a nickel, chromium, iron super alloy and for the different material properties I'm going to fill in a bunch of these but a few are only required depending on the analysis that you want to perform so first off we have our density density is actually only required for modal analyses if you take a look at the different equations involved in stress and strain Mass doesn't actually appear in there. It's really based on Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio and other different properties. But I like to be as complete as I can. And I happen to know that, or I happen to have not written down, the density of ink and L625 is 0 0.305 pounds per cubic inch. And if you have it in a different set of units, you have a drop down list that allows you to specify it maybe in grams per cubic centimeter. Now we're on the structural tab. I'm going to define this as an isotropic material, but you also have the ability to define orthotropic or transversely isotropic materials if, for example, you are using composite materials. And for our stress strain response, I'm going to do this as a linear material, but you can also do hyperelastic and elastoplastic materials. Next up, we have a number of different properties in here. So for Poisson's ratio, this is one of the ones that are required if you are doing static analyses. So we're going to enter in our value here. That's 0.278. And for our Young's modulus, that's also required for static analyses. And I'm going to go to the drop-down list because I happen to have my Young's modulus in PSI. And this is going to be equal to... 30.2 times, actually let's do E6, 10 to the power of 6. Here we have our coefficient of thermal expansion, and this is going to be required if you are going to be using any kind of temperature loads in a structural analysis. So let's enter in our value there. Now for the material limits, these are not required unless you want to do a failure criterion, which I always think is a good idea because as I showed in another video, failure index plots help you convey the right conclusions to your audience. And this is going to be a ductile material, so I'm going to use my von Mises distortion energy criterion. And for that one, it requires the tensile yield stress and I have that value in megapascals. So I'll go to the drop down list and select this. And this is one of the really convenient things. When you go to the different resource sites for these different values, you'll notice that they'll sort of mix and match the different units. So even though my Young's modulus was in PSI, my tensile yield strength I found in megapascals. And this value is going to be 460. I don't have to fill in any other different units in here, but I happen to have the ultimate stress, so let's go ahead and fill that one in as well. And that one I'm going to use a value of 880. I don't have the fatigue, fatigue analysis module, but if you do, you could specify your fatigue model that you want to use. And this requires you to specify a failure strength reduction factor. So let's say I want to use a value of 0.9 for that. Again, I'm just making that up out of thin air. When you're doing fatigue analysis, it's going to end up analyzing the number of cycles to failure for your model based on crack propagation. So your material type matters and also your surface finish 
matters in that situation as well. For thermal analyses, we have a few different materials that are required. And you'll notice here from our or symmetry drop down menu, you can also choose here whether they are isotropic, orthotropic, or transversely isotropic. If I were to choose one of these other different ones, you'll notice that you're, you have different thermal conductivity that you can specify in the different directions. But I'm going to choose this as being isotropic. And for my specific heat capacity, I happen to have that value in joules per kilogram degree Kelvin, and that's going to be a value of 410. And the thermal conductivity, I have that in watts per meter Kelvin. And let's fill in that value of 9.8. And both of those values are required if you are going to be doing thermal analyses. And in that way, I've set up the model uh, as necessary for defining my material. Now, in order to use this over and over again, uh, I can save this to my model, and that way it'll be saved inside of here. I can also save this to uh, out to disk. So if I can save a copy of this particular material, let me save this out to where I have my different materials stored on my computer and that way I can retrieve this one to use it again in other different models. Alright, so that is good for defining my material. Let's take a look at one other thing that I want to show you. Uh, this is a material that's used in high temperature applications and what you'll find in a lot of those different situations is sometimes your material properties change based on those different values and for example the Young's modulus changes at high temperatures so I could right click on here and choose function and actually define a new function uh, that would have the different values for the Young's modulus at different temperatures. And you can choose the interpolation between the values, whether it's going to be linear or logarithmic interpolation. So just something to mention uh, for having your material properties change as a value of the function. But let's cancel out of here. And I've got it assigned to my model. Let me click the OK button to get out of this dialog box. Now if I actually want to use that material in one of my analyses, I'll go to the material assignment and this brings up this dialog box and the material is in my model. It's the only one that I have in my model at this time. I could click the more button if I wanted to. Also, if this was a composite material, I could define a material orientation so that I could specify which is my one direction versus my two and my three directions because typically with your composite materials, your strength is primarily in the one direction. You might have lower property values in the two and three directions. But I am using this as an isotropic material, so I do not need to define a material orientation. That's good. Let's click the OK button. And that way I can see in my model tree that I have this material assignment. It also shows up as a symbol in the graphics area. Sometimes when you're analyzing an assembly, these different icons that you can have sometimes clutter up the screen. So if you go to the in graphics toolbar, you have a simulation display control dialog box and you can specify what's being displayed or not. So for example, if I go to the modeling entities, uh, here we have the material assignments and I can uncheck that. If I click the preview button, that icon is no longer displayed in the graphics area. And you also might want some of those different entities turned off if you are trying to do some view graph engineering and making different pictures that you want to appear in a report. So this is good. Let's click the OK button. And that way I've got my material defined and assigned. I hope you enjoyed this video. For more information, please visit www.creowindshield.com. If you learned something from this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you like this video, please click the subscribe button to be informed when new videos are uploaded. Thank you very much.